Good afternoon. This is Ann Greiner, President and CEO of the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative. And for this afternoon's programming, we're going to be talking about transforming clinical practice by supporting patient and family decision making. We have a terrific um, uh, group of experts that are joining us for this conversation today. And I will give um, more involved introductions, but at the highest level, we've got Beverly Johnson, President and CEO of the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. Wendy Nickel, who's Director of the American College of Physicians Center for Patient Partnership in Healthcare. Uh, Jacinta Smith, who's the Program Manager um, here at the PCPCC in our uh, CMMI slash CMS grant. Uh, focused on patient and family engagement, and Daniel Wolfson, Executive Vice President and COO of the ABIM Foundation. Um, we're, we have a very exciting program ahead of us, and uh, we welcome all of you to it. Um, I also would like um, the members who have joined the call, the executive members on the line, to let you know that on April 12th, uh, we're going to have a follow-up conversation that is more intimate with each of these, with all of these experts together. And um, please, we encourage you to join that um, call, and you can do so by um, emailing Allison Gross, and that's there here on the um, on the screen. Um, uh, to join and register for that event. Um, our next webinar on April 30th, also at 3 o'clock, um, uh, same, same day, same time, will be on integrating primary care into the community. And um, we have uh, a number of confirmed experts for that as well. Um, uh, uh, a leading expert from the Y and also from Health Teamworks. Um, as always, if you're interested in joining the PCPCC executive membership, uh, we encourage you to do so and ask that you reach out to Allison Gross, and her email is there. Um, we've got hundreds of people on this webinar today, so we ask you if you have questions to um, uh, write them into the chat box, and we will reserve time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. So without um, further ado, let me introduce our um, our panelists. Um, Bev Johnson, as I said earlier, she's president and CEO of the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care, has over 30 years of experience in organizational development and management, particularly on this topic of patient and family engagement. She's worked as a health professional in direct care in hospitals, um, and also um, had uh, roles as as a teacher in academic settings. She served as trustee of a hospital, a national healthcare organization, and a school board. Welcome, Bev. I would also note that um, Beverly is on the PCPCC board of directors, so we're very pleased to have her here today. Uh, Wendy Nichols, as I said earlier, she's with ACP and she directs her patient partnership in healthcare. And um, this. Um, focus within uh, ACP was established really to support partnerships between clinicians, patients, and their families um, to help with um, uh, shared decision making and engagement and, and education. And Wendy has over 20 years of experience in healthcare focusing on quality, safety, and the experience of care. Uh, Jacinta Smith is the program manager. Uh, for the uh, CMMI, CMS grant that I mentioned earlier. Um, specifically, that's the support and alignment network uh, for patient caregiver and community engagement at the PCPCC. And Daniel Wolfson, uh, who I've worked with in my past life and um, am pleased to be able to continue working with him, is Executive Vice President and COO of the ABIM Foundation. And um, Daniel uh, was founding president and CEO of the Alliance of Community Health Plans, formerly the HMO Group, uh, which is a leading association of not-for-profit and provider-sponsored health plans. Um, so let me just say a word about um, uh, our work with TCPI. Um, this grant is a three-year grant um, that um, 
uh, we're we're uh, halfway, almost halfway through the third year, and really the first two years we worked with um, close to 140,000 clinicians um, to help prepare them um, for large-scale health transformation. And our particular focus um, is uh, patient and family engagement. Um, Clinicians, um, I think, recognize that, um, you know, the world is moving towards um, uh, advanced payment models, and along with that are, um, are evolving the way that they deliver care. Um, participants in um, TCPI can um, meet their patient engagement requirements uh, with respect to macros quality payment program. So there's an additional incentive for um, clinicians to participate um, in this in this collaborative work. Um, our focus, as I said earlier, has been on patient and family engagement and really helping to bring um, those concepts uh, through education and through tools. And starting in our third year and into our fourth year, we're going to be focusing on bringing patient and family engagement um, into the Choosing Wisely campaign. Uh, now let me turn this over to Jacinta Smith, who will uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the TCPI work that PCPCC has been leading, and then um, we look forward to hearing from all of our experts. Jacinta. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take a few moments to build on Anne's overview of TCPI and share what the PCPCC SAN is doing to advance this national initiative. So as you see here, there are seven aims in TCPI that set the stage for clinical practices to be successful in transformation. These aims lead to improved health outcomes, reduced unnecessary hospitalizations, and significant cost savings. Thankfully, TCPI participants Aren't, asked, aren't tasked with achieving these aims on their own. They have access to a robust network of over 40 national and regional collaborative organizations prepared to guide them in this work. The PCPCC is the only support and alignment network in TCPI focused solely on patient, caregiver, and community engagement. Our goal is to support practice improvement teams through our diverse network to foster partnerships with patients, family caregivers, and community organizations to achieve common goals of improved care, better health, and reduced costs. Our SAN offers a variety of training and technical assistance on activities related to patient and family engagement as listed here. Tailored support is primarily provided to practices enrolled in TCPI to help meet their unique needs. However, all of our resources and archive learning events are free and available to the public on our website. To serve 140,000 clinicians, we need a team. So we've joined forces with the Institute for Patient and Family Center Care, the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, X4 Health, and the Y to drive impact. I'll go ahead and wrap up here so you can jump right in and hear from our awesome panel today, but please feel free to contact us should you have any additional questions or interest in our work in TCPI. As I mentioned earlier, all of our resources and additional information can be found on our website at www.pcpcc.org slash TCPI. And with that, I'll hand it over to Daniel. Thank you. Um, Glad to be here today. If I can advance the slide. There I am. Um, I'm having a hard time advancing the slides. Thank you. Um, so many of you know the Choosing Wisely campaign. We've been around since 2012, and it's to foster conversations between doctors and patients about what care is needed and avoiding unnecessary care, care that can possibly harm patients. And the campaign is really based on supporting patients and physicians in a conversation about overuse of tests and procedures and to support both of them in this conversation. Next slide, please. And we believe in engagement and partnership with organizations and, and with uh, different uh, sectors, but 
uh, at the center of all this is the patient and physician uh, partnership. And we built this uh, first and foremost around patients and, phys and physicians. We uh, partnered with over 80 specialty societies and over 60 uh, consumer uh, employer groups. And as the basis and then the foundation of that, we've also began to work with delivery systems to implement the government, consumer groups, and payers. Next slide, please. So we got a grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, to uh, really begin implementation. And we did it in a way that I thought um, really brought out the best of all stakeholders. We contracted uh, first with uh, regional health collaboratives, many of uh, them you see here, all of them you see here, and they contracted with two, two large delivery systems and a uh, physician organization. Next slide, please. And we learned a lot. Uh, we learned about alignment of values and framing and putting down simple rules, engagement and partnership, a bottoms up approach, which we really think is important to this whole endeavor to get things from the, uh, from the front line with support from the top. Um, the need for system and performance improvement approaches. We were, you know, th we were certainly thinking about engagement, engagement of the physician, engagement of the patients, engagement of multi multiple stakeholders. And w it was about that engagement and that cultural change, but culture by itself can't do the job. So I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, what we've learned about system and performance improvement, but I really wanna focus on the last, the need for patient and family engagement. Next slide, please. So um, need for system improvement. Uh, we really uh, took this out of some uh, interviews that we did with uh, uh, Friar uh, and Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, who had done excellent work and lowering uh, lower back pain, uh, imaging for lower back pain, uh, which had been a difficult thing for health systems to do. So we wanted to determine what it was that really uh, brought uh, their rates down by like 75% uh, imaging for lower back pain uh, for, uh, for, on, for initial onset of lower back pain. And uh, the bottom line is they threw every kind of intervention that you can think of at, at this problem. And uh, Caracola's paper around this suggests that multi-component interventions uh, work the best. Next slide, please. So here they are. They targeted uh, recommendations and clinicians. They identified a matrix to be used. And in this case, in the tar you might say, of course, they targeted clinicians but they targeted specific clinicians. They targeted primary care physicians. They identified the matrix to be used and in fact adjusted uh, the NCQA lower back pain. They educated, uh, you know, physicians, uh, you know, learned a certain way and they need to keep up to date on what those uh, recommendations are and what those clinical pathways are. Um, they did a lots of peer-to-peer -peer comparisons and academic detailing where they actually sat down with physicians who were outliers and showed them their data and showed them the evidence behind it. They built it into their EMR uh, with clinical decision support and changed order sets, order sets that were established years and years ago and didn't reflect the changes in, in uh, clinical protocols. And they aligned rewards, both financially and non-financially. And they prepared the patient with materials in the exam room and the waiting room. It is that defining moment of getting both of those individuals, the patient and the physician, um, supported for an important conversation. And that's how they looked at it. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to switch to uh, talking about um, the uh, consumer engagement side of this. Um, and so uh, you know, looking at our best practices, uh, we see that consumer-facing interventions talk directly to consumer at, at uh, community events. These are some best practices. Integrate patient materials throughout the workflow. Some, some have put uh, these uh, conversions of the recommendations for patients in the EMR. 
um, and uh, that really puts it in the workflow. And I'll, I'll show some of those materials in a second. Um, patient portals, waiting rooms, exam rooms, screensavers, large posters, uh, messages through blogs, mailings, you see all those on your screen. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So um, this is kind of a conclusion of a paper uh, that John Santa did. Uh, patients want communications with their clinicians. Uh, we worked uh, very heavily on providing a communication skill building for clinicians to talk to their patients about why a test is not necessary. Um, uh, patients want to participate in making care decisions. Um, you know, this is shared decision making. This is informed decision making. Patients want access to information. Um, we focused on safety when justified, focused on doing no harm. Uh, of course, communicating in plain language and using mass media and individual consumer. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, brochures uh, that I'm talking about on the left side and posters. We have these wallet cards with five questions. Do you really need that test? What if what what risk is there? Is there another is there another option? What is the cost? And those five questions have been very powerful. And let me show you uh, give you some results of that. Um, this is a study that Consumer Reports did uh, regarding the five questions and asked them. Uh, actually, they went out to their membership and said, start using these, these five questions and we're going to get back to you and see what effect that had. 20% changed their opinion about what to do as a result of asking the questions. 22% said they changed their plans about anticipated treatment. 88% said the doctor was open to answering questions and 90% would encourage their patients and friends to ask questions. That's really amazing kind of change. Now, you might uh, doubt the study and its, its uh, validity, but th these are important signals that uh, this stuff does work. Um, next slide, please. This was another study that Consumer Reports did. How well did the topic-specific brochure work? Before reading, there was less than 16% interest in the topic after reading you'll see these results. Next slide, please. So, you know, you can see how the rack cards are used, uh, the, uh, how the brochures are put in rack cards, in the waiting room, in, in the exam rooms, um, how posters are put in, uh, how people are, you know, kind of getting into these five questions um, as powerful tools uh, to think about uh, how to have conversations and preparing uh, them uh, for conversations and empowering them and giving them the tool to empower them. Here are five questions that you should ask your doctor. I think that's great empowerment. Um, next slide, please. And of course, we have stories uh, from consumers and patients uh, which make the issue come alive. And the next slide, uh, we are hoping to uh, work uh, with uh, P PCC on uh, choosing wisely and uh, in a kind of a learning network, a breakthrough series. Um, and uh, we look forward to that, uh, getting real results by working with both patients and physicians in a breakthrough series. And my time is up. Thank you so much. I'll, I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon, this is Wendy Nichol. I'm the director of the Center for Patient Partnership in Healthcare at the American College of Physicians, and I'm really delighted to serve on this panel with um, some of my favorite people and, and people that I really look up to. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you all about our Center for Patient Partnership, uh, but I'd like to start with just sharing with you a little bit of information about the American College of Physicians for those of you who are not familiar with our organization. 
we are an organization that represents 152,000 internal medicine physicians across the country and internationally. And we focus a lot on education, advocacy, and research on behalf of our internal medicine members. So um, it's very unusual for a uh, physician membership organization to have a Center for Patient Partnership, and that's why I'm so excited and proud to tell you about our, our work in this uh, area. So we do have a long history related to patient and family-centered care, starting with an organization that was a subsidiary of the ACP called the ACP Foundation. And that work was really focused on developing health communication, health literate resources and materials to uh, educate patients and clinicians to communicate with each other. Additionally, ACP has uh, a strong history in patient and family-centered care through our work in ethics. Um, we are an organization that's built on professionalism and humanism um, going back through our 100-year uh, history, and uh, patient and family-centeredness has always been a core uh, concept for the organization. We're also one of the original authors of the joint principles for the patient-centered medical home in conjunction with other organizations, including the PCPCC. And back in 2013, we established our Center for Patient Partnership in Healthcare, really um, to integrate all the work that ACP was doing in a variety of our different departments around patient and family partnership. Next slide, please. So the ACP Center for Patient Partnership is advised by a multidisciplinary committee. Again, uh, another unusual thing for a physician organization, but our advisory committee um, actually is populated by both physicians and patients, as well as other members of the healthcare team. And you can see on this slide that we have patient representatives from a variety of different organizations, including the National Partnership for Women and Families, the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, and Consumer Reports. And I'm proud to say that Bev Johnson, who is a panelist on, uh, on this webinar today, was actually one of the inaugural members of our board. So we're very, um, very lucky to have, be informed by this group of individuals. Next slide, please. So our mission is to promote mutually beneficial partnerships among clinicians, patients, and families in order to enhance quality, safety, and the experience of care. And in layman's terms, our goals are up here. Um, and uh, just to share with you what these goals are, we develop high quality and accessible information that really supports individual patient and clinician communication and interactions. We work to foster collaborations with organizations that are, are uh, interested in furthering the goal of patient and family, family partnership. We facilitate engagement of patients, not only in their own care, but in improvement of healthcare systems and delivery. And then finally, we engage patients and families in education of health healthcare professionals. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more in just a moment. Next slide, please. So the, the primary functions of our Center for Patient Partnership are one, the development of patient and family-centered resources and health literate resources. Two, supporting patient and family partnership in care and improvement. And the third bucket is related to um, the education of healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. So you can see some of the resources that we've developed here. We have hundreds of resources that we have um, available in our patient education library that's on the ACP online website. All of our resources are developed in conjunction with patients. They're written at the fifth or sixth grade reading level. Um, they're all known for being very health literate, for e being easy to read, for really facilitating communication between patients and clinicians by offering patients tools such as questions that you can ask your physician. Um, also, we have things like medication worksheets where patients can fill out information about um, their visit or they can ask questions about their visit. So very interactive, um, these materials. They're available in both hard copy as well as online. And you can see that we have um, a number of different types of resources and they're very popular. Um, one of our, our guides has been in circulation for about 10 years and we have about 1.3 million that have been disseminated um, not only nationally but worldwide. And we're very lucky and, um, and excited that we won an award for our guidebook series 
last year uh, from the Institute for Healthcare Advancement around health literacy. These materials are mostly available for free, and um, again, they are available on our website, and uh, I have that link at the end of my presentation. Next slide, please. These are some other resources that we provide. Um, we have what we call our patient facts. These are one-page sheets that, um, again, share information about a common condition, but also have questions that patients can ask their uh, clinician about a, uh, an issue that they may be concerned about related to the condition. And something we really uh, feel very strongly about in the Center for Patient Partnership is that nothing goes out without patient stamp of approval. So patients are involved in not only developing um, the resources that we develop, but also in reviewing them through patient focus groups and, and other ways that we engage patients to be involved in content development. We've also developed a number of high value care resources. So these are resources um, not only re related to the Choosing Wisely campaign, but also related to how do you get the best thing for your healthcare dollar? And so we've developed a number of resources related to where's the best place for you to get care. Um, so retail health clinic versus going to your own primary care clinician versus going to the ER for a particular issue. Um, making sure that you get immunizations, that's very high value because they're low cost, but they have a very big impact on your health. Um, and taking control of your health by making sure that you get the appropriate screenings for your age and, and condition. Next slide, please. So the, the second bucket of work that I referred to was really supporting patient and family partnership and care. And uh, along with our advisory board, uh, four or five years ago, we actually developed uh, ACP's principles for patient and family partnership. And they are respect and dignity, that patients and families should be treated with respect and dignity in all care interactions that patients and families should actively participate um, to their desire in their own health care, that patients and families should contribute to the development and improvement of healthcare systems and really contribute to looking at process efficiency, how they can um, provide feedback on resources that may be provided as part of the, of the office and provide feedback on, on various um, ways that patients are communicated with by an, an office or a practice. And then finally, participate in education of health professionals. These principles have actually been put out to our entire membership um, as a guidepost for how members can really engage in this whole concept of patient and family partnership. We've also conducted a study, a survey on ambulatory care, uh, with ambulatory care practices on what patient and family-centered care looks like in practice. We've developed shared decision-making tools for both breast and prostate cancer screenings. And I'm very proud to say that patients are involved not only in our clinical guidelines and performance measurement committees and um, developing those items, but also in advocacy for the, the issues that are important to our membership. So when we raise an, an issue to um, the level of really paying attention to it from a policy perspective, we, we engage patients in that process. And you can see that some of the issues that we're looking at right now are related to EHRs, um, how, how physicians are reimbursed, the, the proliferation of retail health clinics, and of course, more recently, things like climate change and firearm safety. And then lastly, we're uh, heavily involved right now in discussions about cost of care and how to initiate cost of care discussions between patients and clinicians. We're doing a very interesting survey on um, better understanding what the practices are for both patients and clinicians. And we're learning there's a little bit of finger pointing. So patients are, are saying, I, I think it's physician responsibility to bring up cost of care. And physicians are saying, I think it's patient responsibility to bring up cost of care. And there's a whole variety of reasons uh, behind this, but um, very interesting data that we'll be sharing shortly. Next slide, please. So the last bucket of work that, um, that we work on is really educating professionals about patient and family partnership in partnership with patients and families. So we feel very strongly that patients and families should be part of the educational process of healthcare professionals. And we've done a considerable amount of work in, in this area. One is that we uh, encourage faculty to participate as um, lead authors and content developers in a lot of the educational modules that we develop 
including those related to the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. We've partnered with Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care and the National Partnership for Women and Families in developing a number of educational modules and tools. We uh, very excitedly um, have had a number of sessions at our internal medicine meeting that have been led by uh, patient faculty, including a session that we call In the Patient's Voice, where we prominently feature a patient talking about their experience of what it's like to live with either a chronic condition or some other type of issue um, that has impacted their health. And it's been very eye-opening for the physicians that are participating in the audience to, to really hear what the patient perspective is um, as opposed to hearing about clinical guidelines or hearing about a new treatment. Um, these have been very well attended and uh, we're really excited about um, the footprint that we've made at, at the annual meeting for the last five years with this particular session. We also have identified opportunities to engage patients and families by including patients and families at our internal medicine annual meeting. We invited 10 patient and family advisors to come to our meeting last year and provide their recommendations and observations about how to uh, make the meeting more welcoming, how to make it more patient-centered. And one of the, the um, things that came out of those recommendations is that in the future, we're going to be having hands-on interactive clinical skills courses that address the relational breakthroughs between patients and physicians. What that means is there are moments in time in um, clinical visits or in a patient-physician relationship that really tends to um, hit the tipping point in a, in a relationship. So, for example, a patient um, may have been seen by a physician for many years and the physician was not able to make any progress on um, working with the patient to overcome a particular uh, clinical issue. But there was some sort of tipping point or relational breakthrough that um, helped that, that relationship gel and helped the, the two come together on a treatment plan that worked for both of them. And so we're going to be talking about those in future um, sessions at our internal medicine meeting. Next session, please. Next slide, please. So I wanted to specifically talk just for a minute about the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. And I mentioned before, um, if you could go back a slide, please. Just uh, briefly wanted to talk about the work that we've done um, in partnership with patients and families in the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. One anecdote that I wanted to share is about a module that we developed in partnership with patients and families related to medication management, otherwise known as medication adherence or medication compliance, um, which uh, are two words that have been struck from my vocabulary, um, having learned from patients and families. But the idea around collaborative medication management is that both physicians and patients can come to the table and talk about what are ways that um, patients can really um, follow a treatment plan that works for them. And that, that's really getting to the heart of the matter. Um, what is it that's going to work for the patient that's going to allow them to um, follow their treatment plan um, that respects their wishes and their preferences? Um, we also participate on a number of the patient and family engagement um, curricula, work groups, as, as well as providing subject matter expertise to <coughs> the PTN. Next slide, please. So the outcomes of all the work that we've been doing in patient and family partnership are listed here on this slide. And just briefly, um, we've had at least 15 sessions that have been um, led by patients at, at our annual meeting. We've developed hundreds of patient education resources with patients. We've had dozens of physician education programs that have been co-developed, co-designed, co-written by both patients and families. Um, and I wrote this word, but I don't know that it's a, an actual word, but I said that patients standardly serve on committees. Um, we have patients that um, it, it is now a standard that we invite patients to serve on committees, including a physician wellness committee that we have now um, where patients are really providing ideas on how to address the, the epidemic of physician burnout. And then finally, <clears throat> uh, as I shared earlier today, uh, we have received an award for health literacy. So thank you so much for your attention, and I'm uh, excited to answer questions at the end. Uh, thanks so much. This is Bev Johnson from the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. And it just so wonderful to hear the good work of both Daniel and 
Wendy and we we at the Institute for Patient and Family Center Care are just proud to collaborate with them and with PC, PCC and others involved in the TCPI initiative. Um, we are particularly pleased that PCPCC is focusing on building these essential partnerships with patients and families as integral to the transformation of ambulatory care. Uh, let's see if I, uh, um, the core concepts of, of patient and family-centered care really are foundational to the work about transformation in um, ambulatory settings. And you can see the wonderful alignment with ACP um, and really the principles of, of choosing wisely, that everyone is treated with respect and dignity, that you share useful information with patients and families in ways that are affirming and practical for them in their everyday lives. Um, and I think the examples that both uh, Wendy and Daniel gave are a, a good example for uh, that sharing of, let me go back a moment to the previous slide. Could you move it back to the previous slide a second? Um, and um, But the sharing of information um, is really key to supporting the active engagement of patients and families in decision making. And then by professional practice, the third core concept is encouraging and supporting that active participation of patients and families, that by everyone on the ambulatory care team. And lastly, the, the concept of collaboration, not just in clinical care, but in, in change and improvement, in quality improvement and safety and professional education and research. Um, Next slide, please. The core concepts of patient and family center care really align beautifully with the newly created shared principles of primary care that PCPCC led. I think you can see these core concepts of person and family centered care, continuous, co comprehensive, and equitable, team based collaboration, coordinated and integrated, accessible, high value. All of the these core uh, principles, whether we're talking about it from the patient and family perspective or from clinicians or staff, they should shape our uh, practices and the transformation work. Next slide, please. Um, I think TCPI um, has been very visionary in the way it is approached uh, defining what they mean by patient and family engagement. So they're, they're really six key areas where they're in encouraging these genuine, authentic partnerships with patients and families. Uh, it's not just we're going to talk about it, but are we really going to do it and embed it into the practice? And so um, certainly we've all talked about having the patient voice as part of practice operations. That means having them on an improvement team, maybe having a, a patient and family advisory council, having them uh, educate uh, clinicians and staff who you bring on board to work in an ambulatory setting. Um, certainly promoting a, a culture where there's true shared decision making. And to get at true shared decision making, there are a couple of things that really have to happen. One is to, to conduct an assessment of the patient's readiness to be an active player in their um, own health care and to understand what level um, they are at in terms of patient activation. And uh, similarly, I think to measure where the patient is in terms of health literacy, this is key in terms of sharing useful information. And certainly another expectation for patient and family engagement is the use of the e-technology. There are a number of tools that can encourage the involvement of patients and families. And they certainly should be involved with at the practice level and helping um, a practice implement them and evaluate them, tweak them when necessary. And then support for medication use. Um, this, we learned so much in working with ACP on the collaborative medication management uh, tool. And as someone who lives with type 1 diabetes, I found it particularly interesting and often the way in, in my own care that the feeling of lack of support for using 
and, and following a particular regimen and um, wanting more useful information related to, to medications. Next slide, please. The, um, you know, when you look at what TCPI is trying to achieve, it, it fits so well with patient and family-centered core concepts. It's basically working with patients and families rather than just doing to or for them. It's that real engagement, partnership, collaboration. Next slide, please. And it's interesting, <clears throat> one of the PCC shared principles um, it talks about team-based care. And this is an interesting article that appeared after an Institute of Medicine, I think it was called that at the time, published a, a very interesting book on team-based care. But this article came out about a year later, and I thought it, they were very humble people who were involved in, in this report because they said, oh my goodness, we forgot when we talked about team-based care, the patient. And I think, I hope you go away with this thought. In high-functioning healthcare teams, patients are members of the team, not simply objects of the team's attention. And often we talk in, uh, with jargon about team-based care, but they don't see that patients and families are really essential members of the team. Next slide, please. There are so many resources that are available to help practices um, really engage patients and families in a meaningful way. And I urge you to visit the PCPCC website and this particular link here. They're just oodles of both print. Uh, you don't have to develop your own guide on how to be an effective patient and family advisor. There's a very short document. There's a very short video that goes with it. Um, there are just a number of tools that are available just in connecting to the PCC website here. So I urge you to visit that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the roles that we have as part of TCPI and partnering with PCPCC is to publish stories. I think stories are very powerful in terms of changing the culture of healthcare organizations. And nowhere is this more powerful than in ambulatory care. So each month we feature in our electronic newsletter and anyone can sign up for it. Um, it just go to the IPFCC website, it's totally free. And these are some of the stories that we've published over the last couple of years. And they're quite short, they link back to our website, but they give you practical lessons learned and what they've done in different kinds of ambulatory settings. One of the things we're discovering with the stories is that some of the work around partnering with patients and families have started in hospitals and that they have experience in building these partnerships and now they're spreading them to the ambulatory settings. So you can see that in the example at Emory and at VCU um, and Maine Quality Counts has partnered with the ABIM Foundation and Choosing Wisely and they've just done some excellent work and I think together we're going to be doing a webinar in the very near future with them about choosing wisely as part of this work around partnership um, in the TCPI initiative. And we also, with support from the PCPCC SAN, have created an online community called pfcc.connect. And I urge you to have both your staff and uh, patient and family advisors. It's totally free to join the pfcc.connect. You can be join in conversations. There's a specific ambulatory learning community, but you can pitch questions to the broader community. And people from around North America and around the world will join into the discussion. So please um, advise your advisors to, to join and people who are working with patient and family advisors. Next slide, please. Um, in, in June, we will be convening our eighth international conference. I think this year it's on a particularly important topic, an aspect of patient and family centered care, which is about promoting health equity and reducing disparities. We've, we've learned that as we partner with patients and families, we're not always partnering as effectively with the diversity of the communities that ambulatory practices are serving. And so this, um, 
International Conference this year will focus very much on this topic. And and we will be convening an invitational meeting on the opioid epidemic and how to partner with patients and families uh, before the the day before the international conference. I think that's an important area to focus on, and it's certainly been a priority within uh, the uh, TCPI initiative. Next slide, please. And just to close, I, I want to really give credit to this wonderful clinician in the Midwest who talks about what partnering with patients meant, has meant to his practice and his work to bring about improvement. Um, our patients and their families are an abundant source of wisdom as we navigate the stormy seas of healthcare delivery. To go it alone without their partnership is foolish and unwise. With patients as equal partners in this journey, our work together is more fulfilling, more meaningful, and more likely to help them reach their healthcare goals. Thank you so much, and uh, you can advance the slide, and we can turn it back over to Anne, who I think will facilitate some questions and dialogue. Thanks very much um, to all of you. Those were excellent um, presentations, and um, we're going to be doing a quick poll just so we know who's on the line in terms of types of um, uh, organizations and you know where you hail from so if you could uh, quickly fill that out and I will um, I know we can multitask here because we we do that every day in our, both our work and personal lives so I'll begin by asking some questions as everybody is filling out this poll um, actually following up Bev on your um, upcoming conference in June that is focused on on um, addressing inequities um, a number of questions came in um, over the chat box asking both well, all three, uh, four presenters um, whether or not the tools that they have are available in other languages and if um, you know they are modified to try to address different cultures. So whoever wants to jump in on that, um, that, that question, please do. I could come and this is Bev on ours. At the moment, ours are not available. What they have been using is people that are bilingual in various practices and health systems have been using them to guide their actions and working with, let's say, a Latino practice in the community. Um, we will be having some new tools coming out in the future that may be bilingual. I know that some of um, Wendy's are, and she perhaps can t comment about ACP. Thanks, Bev. Um, actually, I think the majority of our patient education materials are translated into Spanish, um, and they're translated not only for language, but also for culture. So we, um, we have them reviewed in a couple of different ways. One, they're translated by uh, you know, a medical translator, um, and they're checked for clinical accuracy, but then they're also reviewed by a native uh, Spanish-speaking individual um, that reviews them for cultural appropriateness. And then for some of our larger projects, we actually do Spanish-speaking focus groups. Um, and just for a very, very quick anecdote, um, we had a, a project on blood clots, and we had the, uh, the word that we were using for the blood clot guide was called um, go with the flow, and we had it translated into Spanish, and it meant absolutely nothing. Um, so it's really important to get that <laughs> translation. And this is Daniel. Um, ours are also translated into Spanish, and they're on our website at www.choosingwisely.org. And there's also an app uh, that has both the clinician and patient uh, uh, resources on there. And, um, and anybody can... Um, ask us for the uh, wallet cards and we will supply them for free. And we're literacy. Great, thank you. We have health literacy of around sixth grade and uh, those are tested. Terrific. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Daniel. Um, Daniel, in your presentation, you mentioned um, a community organizing approach. Um, uh, and also that you had done some work with Maine Quality Counts, and maybe that involved sort of this community organi organizing approach. Can you say a little bit more about what you meant? 
Well, I, you know, the regional health collaboratives, as they're often called, like Maine Quality Counts, um, does uh, reach out to um, uh, consumer consumer organizations and patients. Uh, one of our grantees would hold um, town halls uh, to get uh, patient input. Um, so it was that kind of, uh, I think, engagement uh, using existing structures that uh, didn't need to be created, but were already on the ground, which I think was key to some of the success of our um, uh, of our grantees. Great. Um, uh, this is a question for uh, Wendy. Wendy, you mentioned that um, patients have been involved in your patient education programs and on some of your committees. Um, can you reflect a little bit about how um, having a patient involved has maybe um, shaped your programs or influenced your committee decisions, or what has that actually meant um, with respect to implementation? That's an excellent question. Um, first of all, I, I'm sure or I hope that many people on the line have heard the statement, nothing about me without me. And that's sort of the rallying cry, I think, for patient advocates uh, across the country. Um, the idea that we would, that people would develop materials that they think are good for patients without really asking them um, is really, you know, concerning. And um, I think we've done that in the, the um, health space for many, many years, many decades, really, um, you know, just develop what we think patients want. By, by engaging patients in, in the patient education process, we're learning what they actually want. Um, and, and so they're, we're taking the guesswork out of the development. We're um, making sure that, that the, the information that we provide is relatable and readable and understandable and actually impacts behavior change. So, you know, ultimately what we want to do is we want people to be healthy. We want them to be whole. We want them to be happy and productive citizens. And um, the way we do that is by ensuring that they're included in the process of developing information and materials and making sure that they are able to follow the, um, the instructions or to contribute to the instructions in a way that is going to help them achieve their goals. Thank you so much. Um, this is a question for all of the presenters. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, attendee wanted to know, um, you know, what is your opinion on how the EHR vendors are doing in building patient-facing collaborative systems that support shared care planning? Um, so, you know, uh, how do they engage the patient and family through elect electronic portals? Uh, what are the big opportunities in this space? And then um, in a follow-up, um, also is your content, you know, available to embed in um, some of these uh, EHRs to really make that very seamless? And this is Bev. I can answer the first part of that and maybe both um, uh, Wendy and Daniel want to talk about embedding it in the electronic health record. I, I think that we need to help both practices and health systems partner with the vendors. And I, I would hope that some of this could come from vendors themselves, that they bring patient and family advisors onto the teams planning the use of any e-technology. Um, so often they come very far down the road and patients look at the patient portal and say, you know, this navigation doesn't work for me. This just takes too much time. It's not intuitive. And places where we've seen them bring them up front and say, this is what I'm really looking for. Make it easy for me to get to here, here, and here. And if the vendors would be willing to share what they learn in one place and not have to have every health system recreate a better approach to the e-technology tools would be terrific. This is Wendy. I, I can address the issue of uh, trying to get the patient-facing materials in the EHR. Um, this has been uh, very challenging, I would say. Um, the materials that are currently, or the patient education materials that are currently included in many of the EHRs um, tend to be fairly plain looking when, when they are printed out. 
Um, there are multiple paragraphs. So things that we know from the health literacy perspective is that patients prefer to see things that are bulleted, digestible chunks of information with images and, and graphics. Um, so we're really not doing patients any favors by um, by having the, the type of materials that are in, integrated into the EHRs today. Um, this is something that ACP has been really challenged by. Um, one of the things that we're doing now is we're, uh, we've actually made it possible that clinicians can download all of our patient education materials at once to their own computer. And that way, when they're in uh, a visit with a patient, they can just go directly to a patient education folder with ACP's materials and print those out or, or download those for the patient in some way. Um, but it, it's a very good question. It's a, it's a real challenge at this time. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to influence the EHR vendors to do certain things, but we've certainly been trying. I um, don't look for leadership from uh, the EMR companies at this point. Um, I would look to uh, organizations like Open Notes that advocate sharing uh, EMR um, uh, notes with patients. Um, I, I, I have seen a little bit of choosing wisely in, in EMRs, but not to a great extent. Uh, there, there are uh, companies that are putting in clinical decision support um, in, uh, in the EMR, but that's uh, physician facing, not patient facing. Okay, another question for the group, um, and I'm sorry, there seems to be a little echo there. Um, you know, a lot of technology companies, um, particularly in the last six months, um, have indicated their interest in, in healthcare. And they've been doing that for a while, but it seems to have really ramped up. Companies like Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and Google. Are any of the um, organizations um, on, on this panel working with any of those companies. I mean, Apple just introduced, um, you know, an app um, for your phone where you can get your um, EHR. So I'm wondering if anyone is, is working with those technology companies. That was one of the questions. Silence, so maybe not yet, um, contemplating that. Another question is um, your impression of EHR independent patient engagement tools. Are you talking about a, a specific tool um, or the concept of engaging um, you know, the patient through technology tools. You know, I'm sorry, Bev, I'm not able to actually give you that um, more specifics there. So um, mm -hmm. why don't you just answer the question the way you think makes the most sense? I think that where it's possible and what I've found from clinicians who, you know, rightly so should be very concerned about the time that they spend. But when we have a patient portal that works well for fostering communication, I can speak from a patient perspective that the patient um, portal that I use for my diabetes care uh, will not allow me to save a, uh, a note that I've written um, midway, so if I get distracted, I have to start all over again. It's very restricted in terms of the, I'm, I'm often editing and I don't want to take a lot of time to communicate details, but it is not, um, in my mind, it, it has not been planned for the convenience and the use of patients and families. It's been designed to almost protect the clinician and I think we could make it function uh, more efficiently from the perspective of patients and families. Okay, well thank you so much and I think um, the major message really of this whole um, discussion today was um, involve the patients and families early and often um, and that will have wonderful downstream effects on all kinds of things the way uh, cares uh, provided the way our technology is developed. We want to thank everyone um, for your participation and for everyone who was able to attend today's webinar, and we'll see you next month. Thanks again. Bye now. Bye-bye.